but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. For as long as I can remember, the Friedinger reunion has been held at my grandparents' farm on the second Saturday in July. It's a gathering of my grandmother's brothers and their offspring, a time for catching up, for swimming in the pond, and for a competitive game of backyard volleyball. And it's also when you eat corn on the cob for the first time every summer. Hybridization and improved transportation are taking the fun out of the project these days. They had fresh corn on sale at Giant last week. <laughs> but when I was a kid growing up in a little town up in the mountains, finding fresh sweet corn in early July could be quite a feat. Uncle Bill always seemed to find a few dozen ears. If the month started on a Saturday, or there had been a spring cold snap, he might have to drive halfway to Baltimore. But he was determined to bring home the first fruits. Now, early July corn comes in small ears, yellow and white, with a fair amount of cob peeking out between the kernels. It's not as sweet or as densely packed as August Silver Queen, but there's something about that taste that declares that summer has arrived. Summer sounds like the crack of a bat, and it smells like a honeysuckle vine, but it tastes like corn on the cob. <laughs> there is something precious about the first fruits even for people like us who can find them on offer at every roadside supermarket. But imagine how valuable they would be for the farmers of the ancient world who toted water in heavy buckets and watched the seedlings grow ever so slowly from the parched ground. First the grain and then the ear then the full corn shall appear. The first fruits were a sign that the hungry season was finally ending, that in spite of the pests and the erratic weather, God had given once more the miracle of sustenance. The law that God gave to Moses demanded that the first fruits should be returned to him. The farmers would bundle up their new grain and carry it to the temple, offering it back to God in a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It was an act of faith for those hard scrabble farmers. They gave back the grain that came before enough had been gathered in for the winter, or seed corn set aside to start the process over again in the spring. The offering of the first fruits confessed that all the bounty had come from God and that he would surely be faithful to complete what he had begun. St. Paul says twice in our epistle lesson that Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. On this Easter day, we celebrate the fact that Jesus, who died on the cross, was raised up in a new and glorious body on the third day. Generations of people had died before him, and a few had even been resuscitated, brought back to life after death, only to die again. But Jesus was the first of all the dead to be resurrected. God raised him to a new life of glory and power, a deathless life. His body was transformed no longer subject to sickness or decay. His body is beautiful and perfectly formed.
for that life of communion with God that had long been promised to the faithful. In the risen Jesus, we see the kingdom of heaven realized, a one-man sign of that life of joy and peace for which we hope. Jesus was the first to be resurrected, but he will not be the last. St. Paul tells us that God has his order. Christ, the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. We who belong to him by baptism and faith see in his risen body what awaits us. There will be a great day of harvest when the tombs are open and we stand before God in new and glorious bodies, like the body that Jesus displayed to his disciples that first Easter day. Then we know that God will swing wide the gates of heaven to all believers, and we will hear the joyful announcement, come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The risen Jesus is the sign to us that God will keep this promise. Remember, the Israelites brought the first fruits to God to show they trusted him to deliver the full harvest. There is a kind of marvelous reversal in the resurrection of Jesus. God is showing us exactly what he intends to do. His cards are on the table. His plan is no longer secret. St. Paul uses a similar metaphor several places in his letters to describe the Holy Spirit that the risen Jesus sends forth upon those who belong to him. The Spirit, he says, is the arabon, the surety or the pledge. The word is used in Greek for the down payment made at the commencement of a loan or the ring that seals an engagement to be married. This is the assuring sign that God will finish the work, that the full sum will be paid, and the joyful union will surely come to pass. The first fruits are precious, but they don't really compare with the glorious bounty that comes with the full harvest. Those spotty corn cobs that Uncle Bill found weren't as tasty as late August Silver Queen. The down payment is but a fraction of the full sum, and an engagement, however thrilling, does not compare with the steadfast love of a long and fruitful marriage. That first Easter, Jesus was raised in the darkness of the tomb when no one was watching. He revealed himself only to his disciples, to women first of all. Though God's plan is fully manifest in him, the resurrection still demands faith from us. We must trust the message handed down. We who do not see him in the flesh, but only in sacrament, in word, and in the common life of his flawed disciples. But it will not be so on the great day of his return. Then he will shine like the sun that brightens the skies from one end of the earth to the other. Then all the dead and all the living will stand before him to hear his sentence of justice and mercy. Then he will put all evil under his feet and banish all sickness and reconcile us fully to God and to one another. That will be the true harvest day when we sing the song of the reapers and share in the dancing and the endless feast. There will be no need for faith then when all is made clear. For now, though, we do not see all things put under his feet. We live in a world where ancient monuments are swallowed by the flames and sickness and death stalk with arbitrary power. The other rulers and authorities and powers raise their alternate claims 
They bid us seek for other kinds of paradise, financial stability, full indulgence in the pleasures of the flesh, ambition that brooks no rivals, sculpted bodies, perfectly accomplished children. If we believe that Christ is the first fruits, we will lift up our hearts and place our hope in that which endures forever. We will see that all the glory of this world is fading before him who will put all things under his feet. We will rejoice in the glorious sign of this day that the tomb is empty and his kingdom has arrived. We too will share in all good things with Jesus. For so the Father has promised when he raised him from death to endless life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.